It's indeed exciting uh, in the day and age in which we live to share together what our community really has been anticipating over many, many years. The excitement that's going on in the world around us, uh, the fear and trepidation, you could say, in many ways, is something that the world is just terrified about. Yet at the same time as Bible students, there is great excitement because we recognize that the Lord Jesus Christ is about to return to establish his kingdom upon this earth. Of course, we read in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, that before Armageddon takes place, he says in verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And then, of course, he gathers them together to the place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So our Christadelphian community has been watching the development in Bible prophecy since the inception of that community, based on the warnings of Scripture. And when we look at these things, brothers and sisters, and we see these developments taking place, we have great comfort and great confidence in the word that's been given to us. Our confidence, of course, is rooted in the word itself. In this world we live in, this skeptical world full of atheism and humanism, we read in the words of Isaiah 46 and verse 9, Remember the former things of old. I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. And he tells us, he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So in this age of disbelief, brothers and sisters and young people, we have the word of God laid out for us as that light that is able to give us light in a dark and degenerate age. And so it was many years ago that our brother Thomas penned the words in Elpis Israel about 170 years ago, uh, where he wrote that the future developments or movements of Russia are notable signs of the times because they are predicted in the scriptures of truth. The Russian autocracy in its plenitude and on the verge of dissolution is the image of Nebuchadnezzar standing upon the mountains of Israel, ready to be smitten by the stone. When Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader know that the end of all things as at present constituted is at hand. The long-expected but stealthy advent of the King of Israel will be on the eve of becoming a fact, and salvation will be to those who not only looked for it, but have trimmed their lamps by believing the gospel of the kingdom unto the obedience of faith and the perfection thereof in fruits meet for repentance. And that's why we come together, brothers and sisters, to look at the word of God and to look at prophecy and to look at what our brethren wrote many years ago, because it's there to exhort us not just to predict the future, but to change our lives accordingly. And we think of what our brethren looked into many years ago when they, they put together um, the, the maps that they would sort of line out of, and well, the, the map is the map of the world, but they superimposed over that by looking at history and looking at different historians, where the different nations would be that were spoken of in the book of Ezekiel and chapter 38. It's not our subject to get into that and to try and prove that. There are many uh, sources that we could look at, but the fact is, is that that's what our brothers and sisters anticipated was a scene similar to this. Now, when Brother Thomas wrote back in Elpis Israel, beginning uh, many years ago, 1848, and the period following it, the scriptures were clear and our brethren were resolved. Yet events didn't always look like they had it right. In fact, when Brother Thomas was writing, Alexander II was Tsar of Russia. And uh, he had sent the, the Tsar a, a copy of Elpis Israel. And of course, Alexander would set out on the great and fated Crimean Crusade. The Crimean War that, went, that took place was a disaster for Russia and a disaster for Alexander II. Russia lost and its progress south was checked. However, its aggression uh, never stopped. And our brothers and sisters at the time, rather than being sort of despairing at these things and saying, oh, we've got it all wrong, they turned around and they looked to the signs of the times. In fact, it's interesting, the ambassador of the coming age, um, in 1869, uh, renamed the Christadelphian, I believe that same year, um, there was an article that was cited in there that actually came from the Toronto Daily Telegraph about the Crimean War. And the writer says, the Russians, from the highest noble to the lowest serf, are impressed with the idea that it is their destiny to conquer the world. The Crimean War was generally believed to have been, uh, to be imposed on a, a factual check on Russian aggression. 
But a very short time suffice to prove, to prove the incorrectness of this hypothesis. Hardly was the ink of the Treaty of Paris dry ere Russia was again in the field. So it's not like just the recent 50, 60 years have seen some ups and downs. This has been going on for many years. But our confidence isn't looking with our eyes at, at the news headlines today, but at what the Word of God has declared from many years ago. A few years later, of course, Tsar Nicholas II came to power. And by his point in time, Russia had been ruled by Tsars for almost 600 years. It was an empire and he was an autocrat. But the empire was crumbling around him. And of course, we know the story. 1917, where we had the Russian Revolution. And Vladimir Lenin, Lenin comes along. And the uprising, of course, would bring about the communist power. And at the time, our community could say, well, you know, had Brother Thomas got it wrong? You know, here was this great big Russian empire, and, and they moved to the Crimean, and that was a flop, and now the autocrat is gone. But, of course, it wasn't long before uh, he was replaced um, by Stalin. When, when Lenin died, Stalin, the brutal dictator, came along and took over and renamed it the, the United Soviet Socialist Republic, or the USSR, and he would rule for some 30 years, right through the period of the Second World War. And during the Second World War, the Allies had no choice but to kind of side with Russia for a period of time. This is the Yalta Conference in 1945 to try and defeat Nazi Germany. So again, the question was raised in the community, you know, did the Christadelphians have it wrong? Was it Germany that was the great sort of king of the north? And Russia actually wasn't, because somehow Russia was allied with with uh, the West in trying to get rid of this, this Nazi power. But of course, um, the Nazis would be done away with, and it wouldn't be long. As soon as the, they were out of the way, of course, right after this conference, that of course the, uh, the whole Cold War would begin, and Churchill would give his famous speech um, in America about the Iron Curtain. From Stettin in the Baltic, to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. And so it was, of course, that that great Iron Curtain descended and the Cold War would grip um, Europe for many years. And of course, North America uh, would be brought into that as well. And I can remember growing up um, in high school, we lived in Prince George at the time, which was part of the Dew Line, the distant early warning line. And we would have all the drills that you would have basically about the, uh, well actually it was in Kamloops where we had the drills, but um, this, this cold war that was coming, but we lived, or this nuclear war that was coming, we lived under the fear of that. At the end of this period of time though of the cold war, once basically things began to fizzle out, Russia began to really struggle. And uh, its whole idea of how to organize itself uh, kind of brought it to its knees. And um, people began to see Russia as perhaps more of a sleeping bear than they did the great sort of aggressive bear that was expected by our brothers and sisters. So Russia was sleeping away, and people were wondering, well, is it really going to, to come about the way that brethren and sisters have described it and have looked for it uh, many years ago? But the words of the scripture, again, are true. Ezekiel chapter 38 tells us in the fourth verse that there would be a temporary arrest of the progress of this great king of the north. We read, I will turn thee back in verse 4. And it's after that he bring, puts hooks in his jaws and brings him forth, and his army and his horsemen. But there's this temporary arrest of the progress of Gog. And of course that took place back in the time period of, of um, Gorbachev. He came to power in 1985 and, and ruled through to 1991. And um, during his time period, of course, there was the, the, the thaw of the Cold War that took place. He met with President Reagan in 1986 and signed that great nuclear arms treaty. And then he met with British Prime Minister uh, Margaret Thatcher, and, and after that meeting, Russia began to, or the Soviet Union began to, withdraw its troops from Afghanistan. Then in 1989, he met with the Pope, 
And then everything seemed to go south um, after that because the, the movement for solidarity had been going on really since 1981 or thereabouts. And uh, Russia in its, its Warsaw Pact between the Don and the Danube, that area that we would call Eastern Europe years ago, um, basically began to collapse. And it wasn't, wasn't long until the, the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. And then finally in 1991, the whole of the Soviet Union passed into history. And of course, at that point in time, we had other players come onto the scene. Uh, Gorbachev, his right-hand man, was a man named Yeltsin, who didn't take too long to see his opportunity and push Gorbachev out of the way, and he resigned on December 25, 1991. Yeltsin took over and would preside over Russia, basically, um, during a very turbulent time. The economy collapsed, oil prices were super low, and Russia, again, was written off by many as being sort of done. Well, Yeltsin lasted for a decade, or thereabouts, and in 1999, he was pushed aside by somebody close to him, Vladimir Putin, somebody that was a nobody. He didn't really even have a, a party. And so people pointed this out. Well, he's not even a member of a party. So they quickly invented a party, appointed him as head of it. He ran in the election and won. And somehow he just came out of what appeared to be nowhere. And he would work to restore Russia's economy, turn Russia into an energy superpower, and use the income to help fund the rebuilding of Russia's military reforms. And it was during his first tenure that the Chechen war happened, and we saw that the gas being turned off in Eastern Europe as they wielded their might. Well, it wasn't long before Putin had run out of his 10 years in office, and along came Dmitry Medvedev. Uh, many saw him as simply a puppet, somebody who was just, you know, Putin behind the scene pulling the strings. During his time, we had the Ossetia War, South Ossetia, Georgia. Um, and, of course, he changes the Constitution to allow Putin to get back in and to sort of keep running all over again. And so it was in 2011 that the bear came back, so to speak. Putin came back and used those oil reserves and the money generated from them to really build up the military. And, of course, in very recent years, we've seen the war in Ukraine and the annexing of Crimea. You see, brothers and sisters, this is what our brothers and sisters anticipated based on what the Bible had to say. Take a look at Joel chapter 3. See, Joel chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 38 both talk about this this arrest, but then there is a preparation, there's a turning around that would take place. And in Joel chapter 3, and at the fourth verse we read, prepare ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. So there is this preparation, this waking up of the sleeping bear, so to speak, to bring them down to the Middle East. <laughs> And that's exactly what we have seen taking place over the last few, uh, really, year or so. Um, it, this has been intensified. It's been going on for a while, but it certainly has intensified in the last little while. We read uh, in um, February of last year, this is the Estonian Prime Minister. Uh, we thought Justin Trudeau was young. This guy looks like he's even younger. Um, but this is what he has to say. The Russia's aggression in Ukraine has fundamentally changed the, situ the security situation in the whole of Europe, and NATO has responded with a higher readiness. So he says, look, what Russia's doing in the Ukraine has changed the game in Europe. For what was a fairly sort of sleepy uh, goings-on for, for years, all of a sudden the Ukrainian war came along and it affected Europe very closely. Um, Anders Ramusin, he was the former Secretary General of the, the NATO Alliance, um, in February 5th, 2015, an interview in the Telegraph says, this is not about Ukraine. That, that war was not about Ukraine, but Putin wants to restore Russia to its former position as a great power. There is a high probability that he will intervene into the Baltics and test NATO's Article 5. So when you think about this idea of wake up the mighty men, you, you read some of the political cartoons, and this is uh, Russia holding on to the Ukraine, and the comment is, of course I'm hungry. I've been hibernating since 1991. And sometimes it's the cartoons that really kind of like bring it out and, and make it really clear to us. Another one that I found quite interesting was this one. It's uh, uh, Obama trying to press the reset button. And while he's trying to reset, Putin is, of course, 
uh, moving himself very quickly into the area of the Ukraine. But that's what we expect because that's what the scriptures talk about. A resurgent Russia that would be militarized and would partner with other nations in the region. So we have this concept of the preparing of war that Joel talked about. Well, the next verse in Joel chapter 3 and at verse 5, we read, Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I'm, so, I'm strong. So we go from a period of, of relative calm and of relative peace where we have plowshares and swords, it's all uh, plowshares, sorry, and, and they're changed into swords. We go from, from an economy that's not militarized to an economy that is militarized. And this is the same picture that we have, of course, in Ezekiel chapter 38. Following the setback in verse 4, he says that there's going to be an army and horses and horsemen, and they're going to be clothed with all kinds of armor. And they're a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So what we see in the scriptures is a situation where it's gone from semi-peace to a time period when there's going to be a great preparation for war. And this January, this year, um, this is a report that came out about what Russia is doing in the area of Europe. Russian President Vladimir Putin appears to be flexing his muscle and his missiles. In a briefing with the Russian news media, Putin's defense minister boldly declares his military will create three new divisions on Russia's western flank with Europe and will make five nuclear missile regiments ready for combat duty this year. U.S. and NATO officials tell CNN they're monitoring this, assessing the impact on western security. One NATO official says it's destabilizing, and NATO is prepared to defend itself. We have to remember that Russia still sees NATO and the Western Alliance as a major military threat, and as a major threat to uh, Russia's long-term existence. The feeling's mutual. The top U.S. Air Force commander in Europe says Putin's big missile defense buildup along his borders with Eastern Europe is, quote, very serious because the buildup is denying NATO access to some parts of European airspace. Putin's sending strong internal signals to his people that he's their protector and to potential enemies in the Kremlin. So just hear those words. Putin's message is that he is their protector. And that's something that we think about when we think of Ezekiel chapter 38. Well, another dimension to this is the many ships. And this comes up in Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11, Ezekiel 38, Joel 3, and Zechariah are parallels. You can do a harmony of the prophecies. And it's well worth the time to do that. Daniel chapter 11, in verse 40, we read here about the kind of host that's going to come. It's the time of the end. There's the king of the south pushing at him. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Then the king of the north is going to come against him like a whirlwind. How does he come? Well, he comes mechanized with chariots and horsemen and many ships, and he's going to enter into the countries and overflow and pass over. Well, horses and horsemen and chariots today, we would see as infantry and tank divisions, probably. Um, but this concept of many ships is one that really isn't that far away from us. Uh, this was uh, March the 11th of 2014. The Russian Navy to receive 24 subs and 54 warships by 2020. So it's this idea of increasing its submarines and its, and its warships of different classes, building up the arms race that's going on. But of course, ships today isn't just ships of the sea. We have airships as well. And so this was the headline in March 27th, 2015. The Russian Air Force and, and Navy are to receive 200 new aircraft in 2015. That's more than most world air forces actually own. That's just the new ones they're going to get outnumber most world air forces altogether. So when you look at that, you say, okay, this is what the scriptures say. It's a time of mechanizing, of arming, of, of getting back into the game, so to speak. And although Russia may have, have fallen away from that during that period of Yeltsin, they're coming back with a force. The other interesting thing is this whole issue of the Crimea. What was its significance? Well, on March the 30th, 2015, Russia says the Crimean military buildup has been completed. And the text reads, Russia intends to use its presence there, that is in the Crimea, to spearhead Russian interests in the Mediterranean Sea. The Black Sea Fleet stationed in Crimea Sevastopol will be used to extend Russia's presence in long-range sea zones. 
Well, obviously, that was written in, in March of 2015, and, and come the fall, we saw that taking place. That's our take on it, brothers and sisters, and some of you may have heard this clip before, but let's listen to what the generals have to say. I, if I had time, I would have squeezed in Obama's uh, last election chat with Mitt Romney about what is the major threat that America faces. Um, but we'll let the, the generals tell it to us. The outgoing U.S. Army Chief of Staff calling Russia the most dangerous threat to the United States today. More than ISIS, more than China. I'm concerned. They have shown uh, some significant capability in Ukraine to do operations that are fairly sophisticated. And so for me, I think we should pay a lot of uh, attention because a true deterrent is one where people are worried that if they do conduct operations, there will be some level of response. And I think we have to continue to improve what that level of response might look at so we can deter. Vladimir Putin's Russia behaves in many respects as, in, in some respects, and in very important respects, as an antagonist. That is new. That is something, therefore, that we need to adjust to and counter. Russia poses uh, existential threat to the United States by virtue simply of the size of the nuclear arsenal that it's had. If you want to talk about a nation that, that could pose an existential threat to the United States, I'd have to point to Russia. And if you look at their behavior, it's nothing short of alarming. I would put Russia right now from a military perspective. That's the number one threat. The United States is concerned by reports uh, that Russia may have deployed uh, additional military personnel and aircraft uh, to Syria, uh, precisely because it's difficult to decipher uh, their intentions. These steps could lead to greater loss of life. They could increase refugee flows and risk confrontation uh, with the counter-ISIL coalition that's operating uh, inside of Syria. So, brothers and sisters, that's what the generals in the USA have to say. Never mind what the chief has to say. This is what the guys who have to deal with it in the field have to say, and they are extremely concerned as, as what is taking place with Russia. Not so much um, Obama. Um, and, of course, this is picked up in many of the, uh, the political cartoons. There's the, the cold warrior uh, with his sanctions as he lobs them at the Russian bear, hoping that he's going to somehow control Russia. Another one, put it a little differently, where you have the Russian bear versus the American uh, care bear was another one. Um, and I thought this was quite interesting, you know, when they talk about, you know, isolating Russia and all this kind of stuff. And uh, this political cartoon says, so uh, what are you going to do? Unfriend me on Facebook? You know, like, is that really what you, is that the threat that you're going to come to us? And this is the change, the geopolitical change that we're seeing in the world around us as Russia stands up and as the U.S. just kind of falls away and is not capable of handling it the way they were years ago or doesn't have the resolve to do so. We also read, though, in the scriptures this concept of Russia being a guard. Not only is it going to be on the aggression, but it's all going, also going to look after those states that are associated with it. This we read in Ezekiel chapter 38 and at verse 4. Be thou prepared, prepare for thyself, so there's a period of preparation, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. So Russia not only prepares itself, it helps to prepare the nations that are assembled to it, and it is a guard to them. And that, of course, is exactly what we've been seeing taking place in the Middle East over the last year or so. This is a newspaper heading from uh, March 27th, 2015. And just consider, it's Russia, Iran, and Syria. And you sort of like little alarm bells go off when you hear those three names said together, share the same vision. It's not only about Syria, it's about the future of the world. They want to be a great power that has their own say in the future of the world. That is Russia. They want stability and a political solution. Syria, Iran, and Russia see eye to eye regarding this conflict. So that's the issue that's been taking place. And so when it comes to that, and you see the sort of the mess that's happened in Syria in the last little while, it was very interesting to hear the legal arguments that took place over America's position in the Middle East and what their role was, and Russia's position. And Russia has outdone America hands down. Legally speaking, they are in the situation that is legal from a worldly point of view, whereas the U.S. is not. 
Breaking news of the sour, the Russian Defense Ministry has confirmed that Russian fighter planes have conducted their first airstrikes against ISIL positions in Syria. And it's after the Russian president was given the go-ahead by Russian lawmakers. The only way to combat terrorism in Syria and in neighboring countries is to act preventatively, to destroy the terrorists on the territories that they've already captured. Russia has always supported and still supports the fight against terrorism. But we are sure that this fight should be conducted according to international law. You cannot avoid the impression that the uh, legal basis of the coalition activities in Syria is really flawed. You cannot operate without Security Council mandate. You cannot operate without the consent of the country in question. And uh, we said from the very beginning when the coalition was announced that it was a mistake not to go to the Security Council. It was a mistake. Uh, it was a, another mistake not to engage the Syrian government. Uh, had they come to the Security Council, I believe we would be able to agree a, co a concept which would be acceptable to all. We stated bluntly that the goal of our operation in response to the request of President Assad and on the basis of the decision granted by the Russian parliament to the Russian president in accordance with the Russian constitution, the goal is terrorism. And we are not supporting uh, anyone against uh, their own people. We fight terrorism. We consider terrorists those who have been recognized as such by the United Nations and by the Russian Federation legal system. If it looks like a terrorist, if it acts like a terrorist, if it walks like a terrorist, if it fights like a terrorist, it's a terrorist, right? Uh, I, would, uh, I would recall that uh, we always were saying that we are going to fight ISIL uh, and other terrorist groups. Uh, this is the same, uh, the same uh, position which the Americans are taking. The representatives of the coalition command have always been saying that their target are, targets are ISIL, and Nusra and other terrorist groups. This is basically our position as well. We see eye to eye with the coalition on this one. And so Russia moves into the area of Syria very dramatically back in the, uh, the fall. And um, not only Russia, but there's other nations involved with them as well, one of which is Iran. And this is uh, Jerusalem Post. This is uh, Israel's energy and water minister. And he has this to say, nobody wants to see Russian forces in the area of the Golan Heights, but we definitely don't want to see the Iranian forces near Israel. I mean, just listen to that, brothers and sisters. Like, I mean, you, you grow up listening to Bible lectures for years and years and years, and here we're talking about the Israelis saying what we don't want to see is the Iranians in Russia right on our northern border. But that's exactly the situation that is going on. And, of course, there are other enemies that are involved. There is the Hezbollah, and as Russia moves in and arms the Syrians, preparing them and, and protecting them, uh, the Syrians give their used tanks over to Hezbollah, and so they get a whole set of tanks that they can use, 75 tanks, um, to arm themselves as well. And of course, we know what the, Syri the Hezbollah did with their uh, missiles that they had just a, a couple of years ago. And the Western response to all this, brothers and sisters, what does the American Eagle have to say about it when the bear is on the prowl? Well, it's interesting, when you look at what the Bible has to say, you begin to see echoes of this. Ezekiel chapter 38, we have there in verse 13 the response in the latter day in Armageddon, right? So this isn't today, it's just the pattern that we're seeing or the, the resolve. Sheba and Dedan, verse 13, and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? It's almost as though they are surprised at what is going on. Do you see in this a great armed response? It doesn't seem to be there. They, they roll right through as you read in Daniel and we read in Ezekiel and they pass over and they go down into Egypt. And so that's what the Bible paints. Now just listen to this because these are a couple of analysts talking about 
America's response to this and what has taken place. There are concerns, John, that if Russian jets get involved in the skies above Syria, there are already French jets, there are warplanes from Australia, there are also uh, undisclosed warplanes from Israel. People are saying that this has all the makings for some sort of major international clash. Yeah, but that's why Israel, that's why Benjamin Netanyahu went to Moscow and met Putin, and that's why uh, Obama and Putin had their meeting uh, at the United Nations. Uh, the fact is that, I, I repeat, Russia has parked its tanks on the lawn, and the other states uh, have reacted uh, passively. They have said, OK, there's nothing we can do about this. Let's at least coordinate. And Russia, of course, has been asking for coordination for three or four years. So... Russia has parked its tanks on the lawn. Now this next interview, I'll get a smile out of, I, I love the guy's accent, but it really states it the way it is. Here Russia, yeah, they struggled a little bit to take the Ukraine, didn't they? Yeah, there was some conversation about it and all. You knew what they were gonna do, they did it. We got a weak president, to, you know. Now, they just kind of waltz over into the Mideast. They were kicked out of the Mideast in 73, and now they're back. They're back, and that is no kidding back. And you watch them, they'll move quickly into there. And uh, they got a new sheriff in town with the Russians uh, coming in the Mideast. So that's the world talking. That's not Bible prophecy students. That's the world talking and saying this is the reality on the ground now. And so this was a cartoon, a Russian cartoon, depicting the Russian bear on patrol. And there you've got ISIS and the Hezbollah or the free uh, Syrian army and the CIA all cowering as Russia is on the prowl in the Middle East. Well, consider, brothers and sisters, as well, that what the Bible has to say is that there's going to be others alongside Russia. They're not there by themselves. There's other aggressors on the prowl with them. And so when we look at the book of Revelation, when we look at Ezekiel, it's the gathering of all nations down to this place. And Ezekiel 38 names them off for us. In verse 2, you have Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, as the RSV puts it, Meshach and Tubal, uh, they, and he's supposed to prophesy against them. And with them is Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, and down in verse 6, we have Gomer and Tagarma. So there are other nations that line up alongside Russia at this point in time. Well, some of them are easy to identify. Persia, until recently, it was the Shah of Persia or the Shah of Iran. Uh, that is Iran. Um, Ethiopia, perhaps a little bigger than, than it is today. And Libya, also a large area, but ones that are identifiable. But we also have Gomer in this group. And it's interesting, uh, a man named Edward Wells wrote a history book, uh, 1708 to 1711, and he says, out of Germany, the descendants of Gomer spread themselves into Gaul or France. To prove this, Mr. Candom quotes the testimony of Josephus, where he says that those called by the Greeks Galatia, or, or Gauls, were originally called Gomerites, which word has been, or may be understood, either of the Asiatic Galatia, uh, commonly called by us the Galatians, we have the letter to the Galatians in, in the area of Turkey, or the European Galatia, commonly called by us Gauls. And, and so he goes on. So he identifies France and Germany as this area of Gomer, and of course the Gomeric tribes which would migrate across Europe. So we look at France and we say, well, how do they figure into this whole scenario? Well, of course, following the Second World War and the fall of the Nazi Germany, the collaborating Vichy French, which went down with the Nazis, France came under the hegemony or the influence of the Western powers, and specifically America. And they've been a member of NATO since its inception. Um, during the Cold War, though, Charles de Gaulle came along, and um, in 1958, he basically had them withdraw from the military pact of NATO, but then along came Sarkozy uh, a few years back, and he brought them back in. So France has been sort of under this hegemony or, or influence of NATO. That is, of course, until a few months ago when everything went amok in France. And before it went amok, it was interesting that Obama gave a little interview. But ISIS is gaining strength, aren't they? Well, I don't think they're gaining strength. What is true is, is that from the start, our goal has been first to contain, and we have contained them. They have not gained ground in Iraq, and in Syria, it, they'll come in, they'll leave, 
but you don't see the systematic march by ISIL uh, across the terrain. What we have not yet been able to do is to completely uh, decapitate their command and control structures. We've made some progress in uh, trying to reduce the flow of foreign fighters, and part of our goal has to be to recruit more effective Sunni partners in Iraq to really go on offense rather than simply engage in defense. So what do you think when you hear someone like Ben Carson get up in debate and say So that was the day before, of course, what we're very familiar with now, and that is the Paris attack. Good evening. We start with the breaking news out of Paris and what at least at this moment looks to be a city under terror attack on several fronts. The reports have been coming in rapidly. We expect many details will change. But what we can piece together so far, the Associated Press reporting there have been two suicide attacks and one bombing outside a soccer stadium. There have also been shootings, and a large number of people have been taken hostage. French television citing police in reporting as many as 60 people are dead. Tonight, France has closed its borders with the rest of Europe. We have extensive coverage. Let's start with Keir Simmons now on what we know at this hour. Chaos on the streets of Paris tonight, gunfire ringing out, and simultaneous reports of an explosion at a restaurant. Amid the confusion, there appeared to be four separate incidents. Reports of 100 people. And so, of course, immediately following that, Francois Hollande stated that France is at war. Friday's acts of war were decided and planned in Syria. He said they were organized in Belgium, perpetrated on our soil with French complicity, with one specific goal, to sow fear and to divide us. And so he committed his country to be at war with uh, ISIS. Of course, we won't play you uh, Obama's response to this, where he said it was kind of an unfortunate setback. Um, I'd rather just play for you a little bit of a, uh, uh, an interview that took place right after that, because this is, these are all the events that have just happened in the very recent time period, commenting on that and seeing what has taken place now to move France from being sort of the ally under the influence of America to sort of saying, well, if that's all America is going to do, we've got to find somebody else to help us out. Joining us now, Fox News strategic analyst, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters. Ralph, uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, let's turn first to what I, I really believe is a formidable, if not historic, geopolitical military maneuver by Vladimir Putin. He is attacking NATO politically. Uh, he has moved militarily against Ukraine and Crimea. He has positioned himself in such a way as to expand his influence throughout the Middle East and re-insinuate himself into the European discussion. Uh, your thought? You just said it. I mean, Vladimir Putin, he may be vulgar, he may be crude, but he is brilliant. And Western elites just underestimate him consistently because he didn't go to the right prep school. But the Paris attacks, Lou, were a gift of Vladimir Putin. Notice right after that, he suddenly was able to come out and say, yes, it was a bomb that blew up our airliner. Before that, he was hesitant because it would have reflected on a Syria policy. After Paris, the Paris attacks, he could say, see, it's an attack on all civilization. We must stand together in solidarity. He also was brilliant with how he reached out to France quickly with serious military offers. Whereas the United States, we gave them some old targets right. that we were reluctant to hit because of collateral damage, etc. I mean, President Hollande of France asked the United States, he asked President Obama to help France. So let's get all, all, let's all get on the team. And Obama's response was that dreadful presser Monday morning in, in Antalya, Turkey. What did Putin do? Putin has now sent in his strategic bombers, the, the TU series bombers, Tupelo bombers. That's the equivalent of the U.S. sending Ralph, in B-52s. Ralph, there is the, the, the um, if you will, the optics of this. Olan will be at the White House, but already he is shoulder to shoulder with Putin on attacking the Islamic State in Syria and, and for all the world. People have to be scratching their heads at how suddenly the president of France and the president of Russia seem far closer than uh, certainly either with President Obama. Well, look, my sympathies were, the, were with President Hollande. If you're in a knife fight, 
who do you want to be on your team? A fighter or a faculty lounge philosopher like President Obama? I mean, it, it's a no-brainer. I mean, France has been attacked, and President Obama dismissed 500, almost 500 uh, people uh, killed or wounded in, in France, and Obama says it's a setback. John Kerry basically says, well, at least Charlie Hebdo attack was justified. I mean, this is offensive. We managed to insult the French. Vladimir Putin is helping them. This is as you said, a tremendous geostrategic, uh, geostrategic advance for Vladimir Putin. And, you know, who's, who's going to pay? The Ukrainians. They're being forgotten. Everyone else that's Putin's victimized. And Putin is, as you and I have discussed, Lou, he is on his way to incredible influence in the Middle East that, of a scale Russia's never had with this Shia Iranian empire being built out. And who are the losers? Ukrainians, Europeans, the Christians who Obama apparently doesn't like, who are the true refugees, and you know who else? The United States of America and its citizens. And it's interesting, brothers and sisters, when you, when you hear that they're just amazed at what's going on. And you look back to the Gulf War and to the 9-11 attack that took place, and you say, you know, there's America. George Bush ran on a platform of we're going to isolate, we're going to pull out of the Middle East, and then the angels just step in and, oh, no, you're not. And all of a sudden, America's in with two feet. And Russia and France have sort of been sitting on different sides of the table for such a long period of time, all the way through this NATO alliance. And then all of a sudden, something like this takes place. America drops the ball and basically, as he says, insults them. And immediately, uh, Russia picks that ball up and you see a Franco-Russian alliance taking place. Remember, brothers and sisters, that Brother Thomas, as we read at the beginning, said, when the image stands up at the, the latter day, um, you know, let the reader know, you know, when, the, when this building of this empire takes place, the reader has to know that the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is close. Well, we want to think about this because that empire, that, that image that stands upon the mountains of Israel, Ezekiel 38 and Daniel chapter 2, is broken in pieces together. These are the words of Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35. Then was the iron, which is the Roman element, the clay, which is, of course, that that European Russian element, the brass, Greece, the silver, the Medes and the Persians, uh, which is Iran, and the gold, which is Assyria or, or Iraq in its historical terms, were broken in pieces together and become like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. So when this whole thing goes down, all those nations that we've known throughout antiquity and history who have played their role are going to be united together in this great image standing upon its feet. And that is exactly what we see taking place when we look to the Middle East today. America is pulled out of Iraq. Iraq now has switched sides, like France, and is joining with Russia. But at the end of the day, uh, what the Americans now are most worried about is that the Iraqis, uh, you know, having been a long-term ally for the United States, the Iraqi army has been trained by the U.S. and equipped by the U.S., is now directly uh, fed up, uh, sorry, fed up with the Americans and now directly coordinating with the Russians. So there you have it. Fed up with America, coordinating with Russia, switching sides. And it's interesting, the words of Scripture, Ezekiel 38, verse 5, we talked about this, Persia or Iran are going to be with them, along with Libya and others. And so that's exactly what we've seen taking place with this whole sanctions, no sanctions, nuclear deal, is that Iran has been sided with or protected by Russia, be thou a guard unto them, to make sure that they're intact and that they are able to, well, this is not the purpose perhaps of Russia, but they're able to fulfill the role assigned to them by the scriptures in the latter day. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad now says his troops are advancing on almost all fronts because of Russian airstrikes that started nearly two months ago. President Putin today is shoring up support for Assad in Iran. He met with the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei for more than an hour and a half. The Kremlin says both countries agreeing to oppose any, quote, external attempts at regime change in Syria. Wow. Let, let's turn very quickly to Putin in Tehran. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, it, it was a cooperation agreement uh, between the, the government of Iran and, uh, and Russia, uh, excluding the United States and shoring up Bashar al-Assad. End of story, Mr. Obama. End of story, Mr. Obama. Leading from behind, we've now been left behind in events in the Middle East. So Putin is now calling the shots. He's got an alliance with Russia. Iran, Iraq, and Assad. 
France is going to end up joining this alliance too. Now, France had said Assad's got to go. They're not saying that anymore. They want Russian help in destroying ISIS. Fine. And, you know, but here, here's the problem. It was the president who said, we, are, we have contained ISIS, right? Mm -hmm. And then within a few hours, ISIS attacks in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, Secretary Kerry said, we've got Al-Qaeda on the ropes, Al-Qaeda attacks in Mali. You could go on and on and on. The point where now the president says, look, ISIS, it's just a bunch of weirdo computer hackers in the granny's basement uh, who are really good on social With media, while the rest of Europe's on lockdown. What do you expect from that meeting? He cannot, Nothing. Obama can't presume to replace uh, Russia in that alliance. Uh, he's foreclosed by Iran. He is inartful, and uh, his dodging is catching up with him. Well, and where is Hollande going after he meets with Obama? He's going to Moscow. He's meeting with Putin. He knows Putin is the guy who's making things happen in the Middle East. And so we see Iran and Russia, both of them cozying up to, uh, to um, sorry, Iran and France, both of them cozying up to Russia and America just being unable to, to act. And so we see in some of the cartoons, you know, beware of my sanctions is the great call. And of course, Russia just does not seem to be overly fussed by that. But that brings us to the next element, and that, of course, is Turkey to the north. Uh, this was a cartoon that showed the, you know, the Turks that were going to take on the Russians, and it kind of about says it all. I mean, Turkey is got, has got one of the biggest armies in the Middle East, but nonetheless, you put it against Russia, and the reality is uh, it's not much of a match. Russia has, of course, had a desire for Constantinople for many, many years. Um, they were, in effect, booted out of there thousands, or, well, yeah, years ago in, in 1453, when St. Sophia's, the church that you see there, which was sort of the Vatican of the Eastern Orthodox Church, was overrun by the, the Muslims, Muhammad II, ran them out of town, and basically they established themselves there. And Russia has always kept this as a, as a thought of going back there and repossessing them. In fact, it was Brother John Ramsden who pointed out that on the, uh, the crosses in the Kremlin, um, these are the Greek Orthodox cross, and you'll see there that Christianity one day is going to be victorious over that crescent moon which represents Islam. That's their plan. So this whole idea of, you know, Russia working with the Arabs and Islam and whatever else, look at it. I mean, like, it's really just a, a convenient thing that they're using for the time being. Daniel's pretty clear how this is going to go down. Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 we read there at the time of the end, so the king of the south pushed at him, which of course is Turkey. And Brother Thomas interpreted that as being the British being involved in, in going into the land of Israel, uh, or Palestine as it was, and being involved with um, pushing the Turks out of the land and, and wrote copious quantities on this. So the him there was Turkey. And then it says, the king of the north shall come against him, which is still Turkey, uh, like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he's going to enter into the countries and overflow and pass over. How do you know it's Turkey? Because it says in the next verse, he's going to enter in and overflow and pass into the glorious land. The glorious land is the land of Israel. So if he's overflowing and passing into the land of Israel, then he can't be attacking the land of Israel. So it's a, it's a force further to the north, and that, of course, is this, this power uh, that has been in the Middle East. So it's really interesting when we see then the hostilities boiling up in the Middle East, especially when it comes to the Turks. It was a bromance destined never to last. The Tsar and the Sultan, two leaders accused of being autocrats with strong nationalist tendencies, both unwilling to back down or lose face. Russia and Turkey had long been at loggerheads over Syria but this was the moment now defining that relationship. The shootdown of a Russian plane by Turkish interceptors setting Putin and Erdogan on a collision course. A furious Russian president called it a stab in the back, delivered by the accomplices of terrorists. He demanded an immediate apology, which never came. Instead, bristling at the Kremlin insults, the Turkish leader called for Russia to say sorry. It was, after all, Turkish airspace, he told CNN, that was violated. That apology was never going to happen either.
And so just this last week then, while that's been going on for a few weeks now, or that's in November, um, what we find is that Russia is pushing ever closer against the borders of Turkey. Russia is about to build a new air base in Syria along the border with Turkey. Senior defense officials tell Fox News that Russian military personnel have been surveying an airfield in the city of Kamishli. The move follows a military buildup in Latakia last fall where they built the first air base for the uh, Russian uh, jets. The potential base likely to inflame further tensions with NATO member Turkey that shot down a Russian warplane in November, an act that Putin described as, quote, a war crime. Well, first of all, the air base at Latakia is only able to handle about 30 to 35 aircraft. It's a very, very small air base. This new one is actually building on an older Syrian air, air base. It's going to be far more expensive, but more, a couple of points are important here, Lou. Number one is this new air base is in, is in the part of Syria that's controlled by, uh, uh, by the Kurds. And secondly, it's right up against the Turkish border, about 20 miles from the Turkish border. So what this allows the Russians to do is, again, to poke a stick in the eye of the Turks uh, to try to punish them for shooting down that, uh, uh, that uh, Russian fighter plane and mm -hmm. also to expand their presence in Syria. Now, Russia today is an expanding power in the Middle East, and they're not going to stop anytime soon, Lou. Really, this isn't about Assad. I mean, Putin could care less about the future of Assad. This is about Putin. Uh, he will do what he wants to do. I don't think he under. I don't think he's ever taken a course in uh, in finance, and I don't think he cares. His number one priority is to split NATO. Of course, Turkey is a member nation of NATO. His second ambition is to expand Russian presence in the Middle East, and the third uh, objective is to feed this nationalistic nuttiness to the Russian people. And by this move, he's succeeding in doing all three, Lou. Conjecture, right. if you will, though, how likely it is with oil, upon which uh, Russia is extraordinarily dependent, and much of the Middle East, they have a very common, strong interest there in raising prices. And, uh, yeah. and conflict is one of the surest ways to do so. Absolutely. What is the likely conflict that would emerge that would achieve all that you've talked about here tonight, plus restore higher prices for crude oil? And your point about uh, the price of oil is spot, spot on. We just saw it go up 4% today. Putin, in order for his military to continue to modernize, needs oil at about $80 a barrel. He's got a long way to go, and until he reaches that $80 mark, uh, he'll never be able to fully modernize his military. Isn't it strange, Lou, that America's greatest national security advantage in Europe and the Middle East is the price of oil? And so that's what's been rolling out over the last few weeks. I mean, my brother sent me a text from Saskatchewan showing that the price of gas there was 64 cents a liter the other day. And, you know, that's the, the situation. We haven't seen prices like that in, in decades. And so when you look at that, you say, okay, well, how is this going to affect Russia? Well, you are in the words of Ezekiel that he's going to put hooks in thy jaws, right? There's going to be a certain climate that's going to cause Russia to be brought into this conflict. I will put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army and horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor. Now, whether it is the economic situation that, that builds and builds that leads to that, we don't know. But what we do know is that all of these events are pushing the nations towards the Middle East and are certainly raising the temperature there. So this is just the other day. Uh, the Davos uh, Economic Summit is going on, and uh, this is from that summit. I don't think you can underestimate how bad the situation is in Russia right now. You've got oil well below a a any, any measure where, where the budget can survive, where the economy is doing well. And then you add on top of that, you have um, uh, sanctions coming from the West. And so Russia is, is in what I would say is a, is a, is a real serious <laughs> economic crisis. And what that does is um, it causes two things. It causes the, the um, uh, Putin regime to uh, create nationalism, to like create a foreign enemy. And so you, you see Ukraine, you see Syria, and it creates repression inside of Russia. And so I would say that, that it's a very brittle and, and very um, un, unstable place and, and right yet now. And I, I, I can, because there are other issues going on, including the Middle East at the moment. So is there a possibility of thawing of relations with the West to come, do you think? 
Um, I, I, I really don't think so. I mean, at, at this point in time, um, it's just going to get worse because it has nothing to do with. The, I mean, the West can have every intention they want, if 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 the domestic political situation in Russia is that that Putin needs a foreign enemy because people are hungry. Um, he's going to create foreign enemies, and no matter what, whatever we want, if oil prices stay where they are, Putin's going to misbehave, and, and if Putin misbehaves, there's no way we can step back from sanctions. Well, the, the basic situation is they're running out of money. The Central Bank of Russia has, in theory, they, they claim about $360 billion. Um, there are many people, experts, that say about $150 billion of that is not real money. So let's say that they have $200 billion, and they're burning through all sorts of money right now because of these low oil prices and because of the sanctions. It, they, they just don't have the money to support the ruble, and so Russians are just suffering. They have 150 million people, they have a huge military, they have huge social expenditures, and the money, just they just don't have enough money to go around. And so um, at some point, something's got to give. They're, they're still eating into their what they call rainy day fund, so they have, they have, they have a bit of money that they're burning through quickly to try to, to try to ease the pressure on the people. But eventually, they're going to run out of that money. And when they do, that's when the real trouble begins. And so, Brown, the sisters and young people, you know, that's sort of the, the temperature of things right now with the world and with where Bible prophecy is at. Um, and, and it really must be impressed upon us how close we are. These are things that have been looked at in our community for 170 years. They've been anticipated. They've been written about. And I don't know about you, but I remember when I was a young man, in, in classes when I was in my teens and with our brother Paul and, and we would go through these things in Daniel. These were all in the future. These were all things that one day this is going to happen. One day Russia is going to come back and one day this is going to take place. And now we're seeing it taking place right in front of us. And so as brother Thomas said, look, when Russia makes its move for building up its image empire, let the reader know that the end of all things present constituted is at hand. That the Lord is at the door. And I'm just going to take a minute. This is one minute clip. If you think, well, that's all over in the Middle East. It's all over in Europe. It's way, way, way from us in Canada. And we don't have to worry about this. Guess again, young people. This is on our doorstep. On state-controlled television, Russia projecting its power into the Arctic. In recent months, the Kremlin has staged some of its biggest ever military exercises in the region deploying a newly created Arctic Brigade, raising concerns this could be the next frigid flashpoint in its standoff with the West. Security and resources, along with the other northern countries with Arctic territories, including the United States, Russia is acutely aware of the vast potential beneath the melting ice up to a quarter of the world's undiscovered oil and gas, but also the lucrative new trade routes opening up as the polar ice cap recedes. But protection of its Arctic interests is emerging as a major Kremlin theme, and one which could easily draw Russia and its Arctic neighbours into conflict. Well, guess who those Arctic neighbours are? That's Canada and that's the United States. So young people, we need to take a look at our lives and recognize that the, the comfortable life that we have in North America is just a hair's breadth away from a situation that could develop that could be, as our brother Graham Pierce wrote many years ago, another time of testing for us. So the time is now for us to awake out of sleep. The time of our salvation is nearer than we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. So the exhortation is, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light.